Okay, I've been given the signal to start, so uh, we'll just set off. So what I'm going to uh, talk to you today uh, is about um, different ways of um, controlling what users can access, both inside a, a web application, ASP.NET Core, and also in the database. Um, but this really came from a, some work I did for a, a client. They, uh, um, they came to me because they had lots of databases and lots of performance and lots of things they wanted to do. Um, and I'd written this book, Entity Framework Core in Action. And so we had a really nice discussion about that. And I felt very happy with those bits. And then they said, um, we have this quite complex set of rules on what our users um, do. And this is where <laughs> we went down a hole, right? So, um, so I said, we were talking through what they needed to do, and this is really important to them. So I said, well, um, what, have, what have you done so far? And they said, oh, we had two developers working on it for about a month and a half, two months, but we fired them because they couldn't do it. So, so that was a start. Um, and then, um, OK, so um, uh, did they do anything I could look at? No. There's no code, you've got to start again. Um, and OK, so what's, who, who's, what other developers he got? Okay, well, um, it's you and a guy in the company that has learned AngularJS in his spare time is going to do the front end. <laughs> they did have a good project manager, and they were going to hire people. But it was, a, you know, on the first, talking about the databases, I was very happy. But now, I'm not so confident. <laughs> So this is a story about how I solved this and uh, some of the good things that came out of it. Um, what I said to them, that I can help you on, on the database. I'll give me three or four weeks, and I'll look into this um, problem and see whether I feel I can solve it or not. So we're going to talk about that and some of the things that you might find useful out of it. But first, we're going to do a super quick look at ASP.NET Core Identity, because this is, we'll get the terminologies right and, uh, um, you know, make sure everybody's on the same page. So, this identity feature has two parts, authentication, which is logging in, um, I've lost my password, all those sort of things, and then authorization, which is once you're logged in, what can you do, okay? Um, and those two parts are going to turn up a lot. The other thing is um, it, in, in authentication with ASP.NET Core, you can use their own system, which is really good, um, and, uh, but you can use lots of other things, social logins, and you have um, APIs to allow external authentication people take over that part. Um, when it comes to authorization, what people can do. There are two ways you can do it in uh, ASP.NET Core. One is uh, the role-based. So each user is given a set of roles. And this um, authorized, you can see there, authorized roles, staff, manager, will you put that on a, um, some, uh, on a action inside uh, the website. and. You, the ro user will only be able to access it if they've got the role staff or, or manager. And new in ASP.NET Core is policy-based, where you can write your own, own rules. And they had an example around uh, checking with the, their age and things like that. I didn't quite get that at the beginning, but it turns out policy-based um, rules authorization is very helpful. So, um, so that's the uh, super quick intro. I want to talk about the limitations of role-based systems. Um, role-based systems have been uh, around for a while. It was in ASP.NET MVC, and I'm, I've used it, and I'm sure you've used it. Um, and here are my 
um, issues. The, with a big application, you end up with quite complicated role lists, and they're spread all over, all over the place, and they're really hard to manage, right? Um, there is another thing which, okay, uh, if, um, if you want to change a role, take that exa uh, example at the top, uh, say I wanted to have a role director added to that thing, so I'd, I'd have to edit the code, go comma director in the roles. So you've got to redeploy your system uh, to get that out um, in, in the wild. And that's okay now because we're used to deploying a lot, but philosophically it r feels wrong. It feels like a user, uh, an admin person should be sitting at a pa table and, and changing the, the way your system works. And this is a personal one, but I hate strings because I'm dyslexic. Because, so biz manager could turn to buzz manager and I wouldn't notice it. So um, this is a personal thing. But um, so I really love IntelliSense, anything that's going to kind of sort it out for me. Um, you may wonder how I wrote a 500 page book with um, dyslexia, but uh, you've got good spell checkers and IntelliSense. <laughs> loads and loads of code. Okay, so um, let's go back to the, to the client and I'll list you some of the things that they needed that the current out-of-the-box system wouldn't do. The first one was, this is retail, and people work in lots of different places. They, they'll, you know, they'll work in one shop as a manager for the week, and then they'll work in the weekend as just a sales assistant, and they'll move around. And this, and this uh, company had been running for many years, and people used their email to log in. So uh, you could have someone who would um, use their email, but they may work in multiple places. Uh, that really, really won't work with ASP.NET Core because um, everything is joint, you know, glued together. Once you log in with an email, you get this. So I had to break that apart. The other thing, um, you're talking to your customer and you get these interesting things. Like they say, oh yes. Our major customer runs their system very differently to other people, and what a manager does for in in there is a very different set of capabilities to what the other people do, and they have to adjust to that. So that tells me that the role manager changes depending on what the company is. This is a multi-tenant system, so they've got you know, company A and all its retail outlets and company B, and they'll be, they could be different. And you can't do that um, with ASP.NET Core out of the box. And the other thing, um, like most services like this, you can buy the uh, base system, and then you have add-ons that you pay for. So they wanted to filter that out, and I wanted to make that part of the um, authorization. Um, I'm not going to. I'm going to sp spend a little bit of time at the end looking at the database. Not very long, because I think it's on the, the bit that people find useful is this authorization in the web app. But uh, it, this was heavily multi-tenant. If you don't know the term, it's um, just exactly what I said. You've got one database, and you've got multiple separate um, tenants, or in this case, I'm calling them companies and you have to keep the data completely separate. Uh, you know, um, security nightmare there. You, you need to make them very different. And this um, uh, system had divisions upon divisions, so that you, know, had, you had a, a company that carried, was across the whole of the US, they had a West Coast division and a Central and a East division, and then the West Coast had got a LA division, et cetera. And we'll see that at the end, how we do that. So, where do you start? Well, I'm an independent contractor. I don't work with other people, but you need techie friends, 
Right, so I talked to Jerry Pesler, uh, who's become a friend. Um, shout out on his weekly newsletter. That is a very good newsletter. Um, and he put me on to uh, Dominic Bayer and Policy Server. And uh, that was useful, and I looked at that. Um, and uh, I was on a, on a time constraint, so I sent an email off to them saying, you know, because they sold it, so, you know, uh, what could you do? And I got an out of office saying, oh, I'm traveling. So had to get on, couldn't wait for that. Um, and I'm glad it did, because when they came back, it wasn't totally clear um, that it would do what we needed. And for a multi-tenant version, it was $25,000. <laughs> and I can tell you the, what we built was a lot less than that. But it was very helpful. It was very helpful. And the thing that they um, did was they split authentication from authorization. And once, you, once you've heard that, and once you've thought about that, it's obvious. But it wasn't obvious until I read their stuff, so thank you to them. And the idea is you get someone logs in, and you get a user ID, right? And then you use that with other information to decide what the user can do. Um, so um, that, that was really useful. Um, I also, um, philosophical idea, but roles, I think, work well for humans. Um, but um, for the, so, you know, you, sales assistant, manager, you can imagine that you have these roles and they kind of fit people. But when it comes to the web application, you're really using use cases. So, um, can process sale. There's most likely, you know, four or five um, web APIs that you hit to, to do that. So that's, that's a use case, and I called those permissions, and I split those, those apart. Um, it turns out that policy-based um, authentication is really helpful. If you want to do something different, this is the way you do it, uh, because you can set your own rules. And finally, I, I used enums for my permissions because it, I get IntelliSense. But it turned out, that, and that's why I chose it, but it turned out to be a really good decision, and I'll, you'll see why. So, um, w when I f finished with the client, um, I, I felt there was some really I found some really useful things. So I wrote some, with, with it, my client's permission, um, and, and it helped them because I wrote in the second article some of the things they needed to do later. Um, and it, um, you can go to it now if you want. Um, but it's, it shot up my, um, my, on my tech blog, and it's now number one. Uh, uh, taking about 5,000 page views a month. And there was lots and lots of comments. Um, and um, more worryingly, people were, I'd, I'd had a, built a s simple um, application that people could run um, again so that I could, knew the code was right that I was putting in the article. Um, and, but people were now trying to take this slightly crappy <laughs> application and use it. Um, in their situation. So um, I'm currently in the process of building a much better version and um, updating things, and you're seeing some of this in this talk. Um, so let me take you through what happens. Uh, this, this is to give you a, an overview of what I'm going to do, and then I'll show you the bits inside. So someone logs in. Uh, I don't care how, but I want a user ID. And then I have something which is a very simple, you know, um, user to uh, user to role. So it's just a very simple lookup, and it says, "Oh, this user ID has these roles." And it, I, I've said it's sales and first aid, just to make it interesting. Um, and then I turn those into permissions. Um, 
So we started with roles, but we don't need those when we're going to the actual application. We're going to use these permissions. And you can see here, it's got, I've got three, sales has got three um, permissions, and the first aid has call ambulance. And then what I need to do is I need to get those permissions into what's called the user's claims. So when someone is logged into uh, ASP.NET Core, they have some claims which go around, and they're stored in a cookie or a token, and, but they are what will determine what, who that user is when they come to the um, site. So I need to get these permissions, and you'll notice um, that the permissions are shown as numbers rather than names, because it makes them smaller. And that's useful because if you use cookies, there's a limit. Um, so that was very useful. So, that's that, so this authentication setup stage now is something that I've written. I've used um, uh, ASP.NET Core at the login stage. But I've written that. And then, per HTT, HTTP request, these claims get put into the system. And I can use the, a policy-based uh, approach to check that they've got the permission. So in this case, Joe uh, wants to go to a, an in, uh, uh, action result, uh, bottom uh, right. No. <laughs> yep. Right, um, and yes, he has the permission read stock, so he can access it. Okay, so that's that's the overview. Let's go and see some parts in it. So, um, oh yes, no. Before I go on, once you split this, you start to see something. You see that the scary bit is the authentication part. It's the bit that I think we all worry about. It's like, um, have I hashed the passwords right? Have I, you know, should, should I have the, uh, uh, is this cookie secured enough? Or, or is it? So that's the scary part. And if you separate that off and you realize that, the rest is not scary, right? All of this, you can unit test um, all the rest of the stuff. And I have unit tests that goes and looks at all the actions in all the controllers and make sure it's got the right, it's, it's either got to have an attribute called allow anonymous, um, uh, or you just have the authorized one, which means you uh, are just logged in, or it has to have, um, has permission, which is my um, um, attribute. And so you can check everything. And, and if I feel very comfortable with that. It's just the front end. And in discussions with uh, uh, my client, I've done something with ASP.NET Core's own system. But in the end, they just felt a little bit worried. And so we, um, we use an external um, authentication system called Auth0. And that meant that someone else was worrying about all that scary stuff. Right. It made it a little bit harder to set up users because you have to use a web API that talks to all zero and all that sort of stuff. But it was, it was, it, you've t taken that away, and my client could say, oh, you know, if the passwords have been hacked or something, it's not me. Right. So that's good. Um, okay. So um, let's go and look at the permissions. Uh, as I said, I used enums, um, and it turns out to be a really good idea because um, you can put attributes on enums, and you're going to have hundreds of these, right? So I can put on the um, display attribute, and I can give it an, uh, a group name, a name, a, a description, all sorts of stuff, so that some poor admin person that's got to set up all these rules can, can look at it, and you'll see that in a minute. And um, the, you, you can decide how fine a detail you want. I've, in this uh, the, the product read, I've got a, a separate one for the read, the create, the update, and the delete. So you can go very fine if you want. But for the roles, I've got one that says, 
you can see the roles, and another one that says you can change the roles. You can add them, update them, or delete them. So it's up to you how fine and detailed you want to go. Um, see the obsolete at the bottom? That's nice too, because you do not want to reuse numbers. If you have now not using that permission, you don't want to use it. There's lots of scary stories about reusing numbers and having chaos. So you mark it with an obsolete. Uh, that means that in the code, you'll get a warning if you're using it. And also in my listing, anything that's got obsolete, it won't show it. Okay? So that, that was really good. And in my little demo application, you see you can list it all and you've got the descriptions. You can imagine you can s filter it down to um, the, the user admin and pick out the things. It makes it much easier for the user. So that's the permissions. Now we've got how do we get them into the claims? Oh, oh, yeah. The quick look at um, a, a class done with NC uh, Framework Core, um, and this is just showing you that I can the permissions. Um, look at the bottom line permissions in roles. I can pack those up and store them as a string in the database, and then I can unpack them when someone reads them. And so that makes it, um, it's not so uh, important in the database, but it, it, it is for the cookie. But also it means that from the, anybody using this um, class, you're only using enums, but inside some magic's going on, and I, um, I use, uh, third line down from the top, I, uh, in EF Core, you can have private fields that are mapped to the database, and that's what I do there. Um, and the pack and unpack pack, uh, just takes the number, which is a 16-bit, and makes it into a Unicode char. So it's very efficient. Um, so let's now look at how we get these permissions into the claims. So if you log in, just standard login, um, you will get uh, a claim called name, which is normally your e e um, email. You will get a user ID, which by default is a, str a string containing a GUID, and you get another security thing that um, ASP.NET Core uses itself. I want to add the permissions, so how do I do that? Well, I found this, um, this really nice thing called User Claims Principle Factory. And what you can do is, every time that someone logs in, you can capture, by putting this in, it will, instead of just putting the claims in, it will come to you, and then you can add your own claim. So here is the code, thank you to See the link at the bottom? Um, that's where I found it. Thank you very much. Um, and you can see the um, generate claims async, which I override. Uh, you get the, the, the claims that it would normally have from the base. Then I have this method called calc allowed permissions, which does that and then adds it as a claim. OK? So that's, that's a really simple way to add anything to the claims that you need going forward, right? And that will happen once when you log in. Um, I'm now going to show you a much more complicated system. Um, I had to use this for various reasons for my client, but um, when I um, first put the article out, people were saying, oh, but what happens if the if the permissions and the, or the roles for a user are changed and they're already logged in. It won't, it won't change until the person logs out and back in again. So, um, yeah, it, that's, that's valid. We, we had discussed that with the client and we were happy. It didn't really matter for them. But in the new version, I've solved this. So there is an event that happens every HTTP request. And for, uh, if you're using cookies, it's called on validate principle. And you can 
get into this and do things, and you'll see that. And so what I do is I put something in there that can recalculate things. This is, runs in every HTTP request. You don't want to spend looking at the database every time, do you? You really don't. So you have to be a bit more clever. And here is, um, it's a bit complicated, but I'll explain. So what I want to do is, if I can, I want to get out straight away. So um, I use ticks. I ha store the time when the user's um, permissions were calculated. And I compare that with something that is cached. So that so, so when that um, something is updated, the cache changes, and I've got this lovely, I like long names, uh, given ticks is higher than cache ticks, right? And if, that, if that's true, that's fine. There's no, no problem, and it will return quickly. But if it isn't, um, I haven't put the, see the uh, line, now calculate the permission claim value and last updated ticks. I haven't put the code in there just for, to, um, it's similar to the, what you saw in the last um, version, the simple version. But once you've done that, this bit at the bottom uh, is really nice. What you can do is you can create a new claims principle and you can see that uh, the li line, third line from the bottom, replace principle. So what I've done is I've recalculated everything and um, updated all the uh, permissions uh, in, in the claim. And the last line, uh, should renew equals true, is very important because that will tell the cookie to update so that it, um, it won't do it next time. So it's going to be, if you change something, it's going to take time, but after that, it's going to be quick. And that's what you want. Um, oh, yes, if you used, um, I, I looked at um, OWASP, Open Web Application Security, to look at um, what, you know, should I use a cookie or should I use a token and all that sort of stuff. And, um, it's very deep in there, but I thought you get, you get a thing which tells you all the problems you have with tokens and all the problems with cookies, and then you have to go through it and work out what, what, it turned, um, what you can do. And I decided that um, it said that a token on its own was not enough. You had to have something else. Um, and the cookies had some problems, but ASP.NET pretty much knows all those and has things to deal with them, right? This is my opinion, but we went with, um, with cookies for that reason. Um, but if you want to look at tokens, look at Blinking Carrot at the bottom. It's a really good site, detailed stuff, and he's got lots on web APIs with uh, tokens. So if that's your bag, then have a look at that. So, um, I'm going to show you a complicated piece of code, but um, don't worry about it. So, what I've done um, in the, I have a, what's called a DB context, which is handling all of my authorization stuff. And I, um, I override two save changes. Uh, save changes with the bool and save changes async with the bool. And I put this code in there, and it's complicated, but what it's looking for is, has anybody changed things which will affect the user's permissions? And if it, uh, if it has, it, it sets that to true, does the save, and then updates this cache so that the next time that it comes around, that cache will be higher than what the the ticks in the, to in the cookie, and it will have to recreate. So that, that works. The only thing I would say is caching across multiple web applications is not trivial. Getting that right 
and secure, well, not secure, but um, re re reliable is difficult. So you've got to decide, right? Do you want, if you want this thing which will update as soon as you change something, fine, implement that. But if you can get away with the simple one, do that, because it's going to be much easier to maintain. OK. Um, we're nearly there on ha putting this all together. So um, I've got to the, pay, uh, the point where I've got the policy um, stuff. Uh, and what, what I've got is I've got Joe. He's got his um, permissions claim. And I, ha I have some, um, I have some, a po I add a policy which will check that. And you see, I have this uh, attribute, uh, this attribute called has permission, um, bottom middle. Um, and um, so it's going to check that Joe has got that. Here, um, the, the policy based permissions. Uh, Policy-based authorization is a bit complex, um, and I'm just showing you like the core bit. Um, it's got all bits around it that are a bit fiddly, but you can see here it comes in with the context, so I can get the claims. If it hasn't, if the user hasn't got these pack permissions, then <laughs> there's n no way it's going to pass. Um, but then it comes down to this, and I've hi highlighted uh, this method of mine called this permission is allowed. It's an e extension which takes the permissions, unpacks, um, unpacks them, and checks in those permissions that it's got the permission na name that is being applied. And that, and that does it. Um, if you want to look, look at policy-based rules and doing uh, dynamic authorization, then Jerry Pezzer has got a very good um, set of um, articles on that. Um, it's, I mean, my code is full of thanks to or see other people, aren't we? We're all building on each other, which is great, isn't it? So I write articles, and I, I read articles, and that's how we're going to get forward. So. Um, we've come to the end of that part, and um, there's the same diagram again. Um, and you can see I've been through all of those steps, um, and you've seen the code. About the only thing you haven't seen is the is the find user roles, which is very simple. It's a user ID, role name, user ID, role name. Okay. So let's have a look at database. I have written the book, so you've got to have a look at the database. Um, and um, this is, um, if you don't do any filtering, then you, unless your code manually does it, you're going to get everything. So that's the, the thing on the left, all or nothing protection. So you're just going to get all that data, and it's up to you and what you do with it. But if we put a per row protection in, we can, um, we can lock that down and, and make that better. And EF Core is great for this. Uh, it's, it's just great. Lovely. Um, the example I have is the, um, and this comes from my second article, is I'm, I'm going to give you a blow by blow of personal data using the user ID as a, as a key, right? Um, and I'm going to show you how I do that. Um, and once you've seen that, you'll s there's loads of other things you can do. But this is, gives you the, the base stuff. So in this case, I've got some uh, user addresses. And you can only address, get to the address or addresses that have got your key in it. So how do you do this? that you feel very sure that it's going to work, right? You could put it in your code, forget, you could, could forget. So let's see how we do it. So I'm down in the, um, I've got a um, DB, I've got, sorry. In EF Core, you have a 
context, which uh, a class which is which inherits DB context, and it holds all the information about the links to your database and all the configuration about your database, right? And that's that's what we've got here. And I've stripped some things off so that I can get it on this page. So the first thing you need to do, you need to get the user ID in, which is very easy because you, um, you are going to use dependency injection. And I've got this thing, I get claims provider. And we'll see that later. So all you need to know is that I've got this user ID inside the DB context. The other thing I do is, I override save changes. You've seen this before. Uh, I've shown just one of them. But uh, what I'm doing is every time you add something which has got the I owned by interface, which is this is the thing that's going to do it, it's going to put the user ID in that. It's going to call that method called set owned by, which is in that interface. And it's going to put that user ID in that field and there's no way around that right it's going to happen so therefore that is going to be um, marked automatically right and if you use save changes it, or if you use ef core that's going to happen um, and then the magic bit is that came in with ef core is this query filter you can put query filters on um, your classes, and it will filter out automatically um, deep in, inside the DB context before it comes to you. So if you do any query, if you do any find, and I found out even if you use, is it to SQL, no, from SQL, if you use that, it adds a bit of SQL on the end. doesn't always work, but it, it's going to lock it down. So you, you, you can get around it by putting in the method ignore query filter, right? But it's pretty obvious what you've done, right? So by default, it will filter that. So I, I like this because um, it's, it's, it's going to happen. It can't be easily bypassed. And um, again, I have some unit tests just to make sure that I've put query filters on the, the appropriate classes. Um, and that, uh, yeah, the only other thing you need is uh, a way to get the user ID in. And there is a, um, this is my I get claims provider. Um, and there's a useful thing called IHTT con context accessor. And you can get the claims. Um, it might be null, so you, uh, so you have to handle that, but uh, it will get the claims and pull that out on every HTTP request that you, where you call that. And, th and, that's, and that's it. That's, that's a really secure way to um, keep your data um, segregated. I'm going to show you what I had to do for the client. Um, for this multi-tenant thing. It's, you won't need this, but it will show you some of the things that um, you might find useful. Um, or, or it's, no, it shows you what you could do. Um, and I don't think you will need to do it, but it, there's so many things that get, op get opened up. So I've got, um, I've got two tenants that I've made up. For you, Inc., which has got a dress for you and a shirt for you and a um, tie for you. Um, and I have uh, Joe is the LA district manager, right? So he wants to just see the, the data around there. Um, and also, I want to keep these, t these two four-ring and this Pets2 Limited in the UK. I want to keep them separate. So what I did is I built a... Uh, a data key using that follows the hierarchy, and I use the primary key to build it. So when you come down here, the the, the company up here is, is has got one. Then it goes to the West Coast, which is one two. Then it goes down to LA, which is one two five, etc. So by 
um, giving the um, Joe there the code one two five. Um, he can, and then I had this query, query string where it says starts with. You can just see that little bit of the data, um, and so that that again is is more than you most likely need, but it's um, a useful uh, example of what you can do. So, um, yeah, that's just looking at the same sort of things count. Um, the In this case, um, you have to link the user to, um, you have to link the user to this uh, LA subgroup entity because someone might come along and change the, the layout uh, uh, and change the hierarchy. So he needs to be able to link to that and get the, the latest. And this is a case where if you're going to change the hierarchy, it's going to be, you, you're going to have to um, look at um, the same thing that I showed you where it will update the, the, the data key. Um, so, let's, we're nearly, um, nearly there. Um, this is a look at what I did for the client with extra e orange boxes that added things that I haven't put in the, 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 the thing that I've made open source and, and written the articles about uh, because I don't think people need this. But you can see here that you, the login is more complicated because um, Joe could work in two t different places, and he has to. If if that's true, he has to click which one, and he'll have a different uh, ID passed on. So I use a, a local user ID then. Um, and the other thing is when you're finding a role, um, it might be uh, there'll be a role manager with. Um, no, a tenant ID of uh, zero means every can, uh, everybody can use that for default, but if it finds a, a manager with the, um, with the um, ID of the company, like this one, two, three, four, see down the, the roles there, then it would override that, and so you could have a, a, a role which is different for, these, uh, for the people, uh, for each company if you needed it. Um, and again, the um, removing the, the paid for permissions is very simple. All it does is it, it, it knows which permissions are in a module, and if you haven't got that module, it'll strip it out. So in this case, um, it strips out sell online because they haven't bought that feature. So, um, uh, yeah, that's. I won't bother with that. So, um, last thing is just to look at the application that I actually built for the client. And um, what we ended up with, we ended up with two ASP.NET um, 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 web apps running um, with um, web APIs. Um, one was doing handle all, all the admin and mainly the login, and uh, then it passed uh, it passed most of the information went into the cookies about where the person was and what they could do. Uh, there was uh, if you had added a new company, there was some stuff that went needed to go on there, and you can see there's a link from the brown master into the blue. Um, web application, that was a, another web application which did all the grunt work, it did all the stock control, selling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there they had, um, uh, we had a multi-tenant database um, uh, for that, uh, and with an Angular on the top. Um, and it, yeah, so it was, it works, it, they've got, the ability to uh, extend it if they want uh, in different ways. Um, and uh, Julie Lerma will be 
happy with this. It's all, this is all using domain-driven design, all the entities are, and the, I'm using what's called packet by feature, or what Jimmy Bogart calls vertical slicing. So I've tried to make the, each part of the system, say, what's one there, authentication and authorization, that is a very, uh, is, a, is in one kind of s set, so that if you wanted to move it somewhere, it's much easier to move it around. Um, and uh, user, um, we've got user man management. So that isn't so important in the, in the master here, but when it comes on to the uh, web application, they're going to add more things. And they may want to run another um, web, a, um, web app to take the load and so they can move things around. Um, and that is the end of what I'm going to talk about, which gives you some time for talking, uh, asking some questions. And um, just to say that I'm in the middle of redoing the, um, the application and, uh, in, and writing some new articles, and you, um, they should be out in the next three or four weeks, depending on what other, what other things come up. Um, and I hope that will be useful to you. So, have you got any questions? Sir? Uh, you're saying that you're using Auth0. Yeah. Uh, one question. Uh, do you use Auth0 to move stuff or get the permissions or you're storing them in the database? So the question was, um, I, I said I used, we used Auth0, and we use, so that is a company that will provide the, um, the um, authentication for you. And what we did is we just, all it that had was their, their, their net email and a, a user ID. And, and that's all we used. Uh, we didn't use any of the other, um, parts in it. Um, Auth0 works like um, ASP.NET Core in that if you use add things, you, they're, they're fixed when you log in. And that's what we, did, we wanted to get round doing that. So we just used the user ID. Any other questions? Um, if yes. I remember, so. If I remember correctly, I believe the uh, query filter does not work for um, navigation properties. So is that an issue you, you risk uh, going like backwards in, uh, in, in navigation properties and actually reach uh, properties that you should not have access to that way? Yeah, so, um, and this comes down to um, a, a DDD thing called root and ag ag aggregate. So you always put your... Uh, you put the query filter on the top of your root class, and you have to design it so that if there are things hanging off it, that you only access them via that, right? You can, of course, um, if, um, if you do include, that's fine, but if you then want to look at it, you'd have to put a query filter on if you wanted to directly access those. So yes, you are relying on this using a, um, a domain-driven di driven design to, to make that work. And that's a, that's a good point, actually. Yes, so um, what you're saying is if you're at the top of the hierarchy and you, and you went include, 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 you could... Uh, so, so I'm talking about going upwards from, uh, like you have a user and it has a navigation property to the company that it belongs to, then you go up in the hierarchy and then you have a navigation property going to a list of users, so you could actually, that user could, you could risk going upwards in the haiku and then get access to all users. You could, um, yeah, you could. Um, what I do is I have the users um, 
the, the control of the users in a separate DB context. So I've got, I, I, it's kind of like, well, I'm, it's not a boundary context, but it's, I've got a, a DB context that de deals with users, and I've got a DB context which deals with companies. And so there, and there is a, there is a, it gets complicated, but you've got a link in here, but you can't go any further. And in the company, you can't get to the users. Okay? So, yeah, you're right. You, you, the, the, you've got to think, like, there's a load of little things, like, I really like using a GUID for a user ID, because you might have to pass that to the front end, and it's a bit more, um, if you had ints, you, um, the user with uh, um, primary key one is likely to be a very powerful user, and you'd go after it. So by using GUIDs, it, it, it anonymizes it a bit more. Sir? Um, yeah. ah, um, so you have a Angular front end, um, yeah. and usually you want to only show um, what actually the actual user is allowed to do. Yes. Is this also where the cookie comes in? Yeah, so, good question. And I will be f uh, um, doing that in the, um, the article I'm writing, and I didn't put it in here, sorry. So what happens is when you log in, you can, uh, you can get, uh, you can get the, you can ask for the permissions, and you get them as strings, because for the Angular, it's better, I think. Um, and that's what they did in the system. And if you want, we didn't do it for the client, but if you want to do, if you want to catch that, um, you would ha uh, a change, if there was this where you uh, updated the permissions, you'd have to, in the Angular, you'd have to be, get the tick and see that it's changed uh, or get something that's saying that you should ask for it again. But it's all doable, and I'll, I'll have that in the article. But you, you're quite right. It, you do need them, and we, we pass them on login um, to the ang Angular, and then it can save that. And oh. uh, yeah, for the cookie part, like I'm not so used to uh, cookies. Um, yes. So basically, we should not trust the client, right? So if the client sends some cookie, we need somehow to validate. If, because you are storing the permissions inside the cookie, yeah. we need to make sure that they didn't get altered. Yes, so um, ASP.NET is good at doing that. So you most likely will want to ask ASP.NET for the data, because it's up to it to ensure that's right. And I, I do understand that for most, you know, single-page apps, you use tokens. And there was a, a whole discussion around that. And I'm not saying you can't use tokens. You can do that. I just, in, in this case, we didn't use it. Uh, so. How would you um, solve it with the GraphQL, where you have, like, only one endpoint? Ooh. <laughs> Don't know really that you well. Um, doesn't GraphQL then go and talk, talk to the web uh, to the APIs underneath? I'm not. Uh, it's uh, querying uh, entity framework directly. Okay. Um, you would lo lose some of the permission at, uh, at the front. Um, but because the, the user c can uh, basically uh, make their own queries, yeah. ask for whatever they want, and you can't simply say that they're allowed to u do this simple thing, yeah. uh, like uh, get products, because they may have 10 different properties, yeah. and the manager is supposed to be allowed to query for uh, all of those, but yeah. staff only four of those, etc. So um, I've described how I solved that problem. You're going to have to describe how you solved that with GraphQL. I mean, this is what it's about, isn't it? We're all finding ways to 
to do this. So I was I, hoping I, you would say that's coming in version two. No, or I'm sorry, I, I don't don't have that. So I think we're nearly at the end here. And we've got one more question. Anybody, sir? Since you have this owner of the data, how do you handle people leaving the company? Uh, okay. How do you handle people leaving the company? So changing of owners and all that stuff. So, so if you, so you're saying someone leaves the company, so you would just delete the, there's a something in there that links the user to a, to somewhere in the company, right? Um, you, if he wasn't anywhere, you could, you could delete him, but um, if he leaves the company, and, th and this happens often, then you, you remove the link to that company, right? Yeah, but you did this default filter on owner ID. That data can't be accessed by anybody anymore because that person left, right? So is that like you get like stale data in your database owned by somebody who is not there anymore? Oh, um, that in, in the case of the personal stuff, yes, that would happen. Um, in the case of the hierarchy, the, the keys are based off the company, yeah? Um, so if the company stops, then think. So um, it's, not, it's not the user ID anymore. I, that's why I showed you the hierarchy. So that is using the, this key based on the company. Well, thank you for your time, and I um, hope you rest, enjoy the rest of the show. And do come and talk to me if you've got anything else you want to talk about. Thank you. <laughs>